would like to try and just operate, find a portable solar panel that I can operate like the other craft off of just the solar panel primarily mm -hmm. yes. and no battery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've heard of that being done. I've never seen it on a video or anything, but yeah, just have the uh, have a controller and yep. you could technically do that. It's just um, <laughs> as soon as a cloud rolls by, then you're suddenly a radio turns off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Hamdom Thoughts, a podcast about ham radio, electronics, software, and tinkering. I'm your host, Dennis, FCC licensed amateur extra radio operator, call sign AD6DM. Welcome to episode 33, where we talk with Dan, KC7MSU in Arizona. Dan likes summits on the air. And it's just as well because there are a lot of great peaks in Arizona. He's the co-host of all portable digital zone discussion on YouTube and has been a previous guest on our roundtable episodes. Thanks for joining us and we'll hear some of Dan's ham story today on Hamdom Thoughts. Stay tuned. Hey Dan, it's nice to have you on Zoom this morning. How you doing? Uh, doing good, Des. Good morning. Thanks for having me on the on the episode today. Yeah, it's a nice brisk morning here, but I'm glad the sun is out. Here in California, we've had threats of more gusty wind, and I'm, I'm fearing that because I currently have a half down fence in my backyard, and. One more gusty week like we had a couple of weeks ago, and that thing is down. Then I just have a bigger backyard that's shared with the rest of my neighbors, you know. <laughs> <laughs> We're waiting right now. There's a, like a big shortage. There's a run on fence planks because a lot of people's fences were destroyed um, like the end of January because of those 60-mile-per-hour gusts. And, yeah, it's just a a waiting situation. I have the contractor all lined up. We just need the supplies now to get everything built. But what's up over there in Arizona? I've seen a lot of snow. Yeah. Well, it's uh, not as gusty as you guys get over there. Uh, I have to admit, until you actually experience some of the Santa Ana winds and things like that, you, you really kind of wonder what how bad it is out there. But it's amazing how windy it is out there, uh, yeah. especially at certain times of the year. Yeah. Uh, I've seen that you've been pretty active. You even did a soda activation yesterday, yesterday morning. Was that? Yeah. Was well, that right? it's uh, it's winter here, so this is the time uh, uh, of the year that we wait for. Um, so we uh, roast in the summertime, uh, just so we can get to this part of the year. But uh, <laughs> it was beautiful uh, yesterday. It was uh, in the seventies, and uh, this next week we're going to be in the 80s, so I took the opportunity to get out into uh, uh, Usury Mountain uh, yesterday, which was a, a fun hike. Mm -hmm. How much elevation is that, Usury Mountain? Uh, it's not very high. I don't remember off the top of my head, but I did uh, did get passed by a tortoise uh, being an Uber for a couple of snails. Uh, I'm pretty <laughs> slow getting up there, but... Uh, it was a fun hike, and I uh, spent a fair amount of time up there yesterday and even uh, spent some time uh, chasing some other uh, summits, which was really nice change of pace. Oh, that's nice. It's always great to find others who are doing the same exact thing and say, S2S, you know, send them the summit to summit. And I'm sure that piques theirs as well when they're, when they're out there listening. They're like, oh, there's someone else out on a summit peak. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's really great when you can pull in somebody who's uh, kind of right at your noise floor as well, especially on single sideband. Those uh, get to be a little challenging at times, but uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. So I ended up 
with probably I think three or four summits summit yesterday, oh, wow. which That's was great. really nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, you're, again, like I said, the, the co-host of the All Portable Digital Zone discussions that happen every other week, I think, and on YouTube. And uh, also a very active ham in, in your local club and in soda. Why don't you tell us about that? Tell us about your background, uh, what you do, and right. how you got into ham radio. Sure. I'm a, I'm a transplant. I'm originally from Michigan. So I've been out in Arizona and the West for about the last 40 years. Came out here to, to work in the semiconductor and semiconductor equipment uh, arenas. So I did that uh, up to about 96 or so. And then uh, decided that getting into IT would be a great idea. So moved over there. It's been uh, really challenging. So I primarily work in have been working in banking and uh, mass marketing arenas mm. as a network engineer. So that's kind uh, of a hard transition. It's a uh, hardware to software, right? Technically. Yeah, it was, it was very interesting. Uh, I kind of got into it by accident because from my electronics, I uh, managed to hook up back then. It was a bridge uh, network back to our uh, home office back in Illinois. And I, uh, after that, I kind of got drug over into that side because I understood the computer systems and things like that. And I've been over there ever since. Wow. How does ham radio play into it? How did you start getting interested in that? When did you become licensed? Well, I, I was always a tinkerer. So I used to come home. Uh, I used to take things apart during the day uh, while my parents were working and dad would come home and find, you know, his lawnmower or the radio all taken apart or something like that in the lawnmower <laughs> yeah anything that could come apart uh usually did oh that's fascinating i, so I never thought as a was, child to take apart the lawnmower <laughs> yeah the challenge was always to get get things back together so uh matter of fact oh, yeah. he used to bring things home for me to take apart instead of the lawnmower so mm -hmm. uh, he got pretty wise <laughs> to it after a while and would bring me things so that was always a lot of fun but that uh that coupled with um, back then, you know, when uh, we were first going into space and stuff like that, listening to that on the radio and watching it on TV back then, it was in black and white for me, uh, was always a, a big fascination, you know. So how do you get those pictures from space all the way back here to Earth? Um, so that always interested me in, uh, in how technology really worked. Mm -hmm. And you were licensed in, in what year? Uh, originally, uh, I was licensed back in 83 as uh, KB7 oh, okay. UQB uh, back when I was in college. So and, that was uh, during the Morse code requirement years, right? Uh, it, it was just right when the first uh, Tech Plus no code licenses came out. Oh, okay. Okay. So I took advantage of that and um, got on the repeaters here in the, in the Phoenix metro area and really enjoyed that. Nice. And you're a pretty active soda ham these days, as as we talked about. You also talk about portable a lot. Uh, in fact, uh, coming up on the All Portable Digital Zone, I think it's uh, next week, right? When when is the when is the episode? Is it every Monday or, or Sunday? I think it's, it's uh, every Sunday. Uh, the every other gets Sunday, I mean, yeah. Right. So it'd be on the twenty seventh this week. So. On the twenty seventh, uh, you'll be I'll be on a guest on your show, and uh, with Mike K at MRD, we'll be talking about uh, batteries, and probably a little bit of show and tell on that show about our builds and sizing batteries to the needs. So that'll be an interesting discussion. Yeah, that'll be a lot of fun. That's uh, something that you know I've never done. You know, I typically have purchased my batteries. And always wondered about building them, you know, with uh, all the uh, uh, circuits that are, are available pre-made now, the battery management circuits and stuff. Um, it's come a long ways. Uh, yeah, definitely. It used to be everything very, used to be proprietary. Used to be very costly, very hard to find the individual parts to it. And I remember, just as kind of a side note, uh, one time. I was playing with my dad's soldering gun 
so he was getting a bit annoyed because I was just using whole spools of, of solder and turning it into like a nice little lead medallion. So he took it and he said, let me show you something. And he, he got six D cells. Was it six or four? What would make a nine volt battery? <laughs> I think it would be six, right? In series. I think it, yeah, I think it'd be six. And he took some wire and soldered positive and negative to each of them. And then soldered at the, uh, the, the final positive and negative, a nine volt what do you call that? The the little cap that they have that that has the nine yeah. volt terminals on it, and he and he gave it to me, and he said, "This is a, a very big nine volt battery. It can power your radio and stuff." And I was just blown away. I was like, "What? What is this? So you put the positive and negative to things, and somehow it increases it from one and a half volts to." And I think I was maybe around ten or eleven when he did that, and I could say that's my early beginnings with the fascination of. Of batteries because I, I just didn't it didn't make sense to me but then after a while I was like okay I guess if you you can add voltages and and from there you know was always fascinated with power basically he he kind of keyed off this whole electronics drive in me by by showing me how that works instead of just using his tools to create giant messes <laughs> yeah Batteries are a wonderful way to, to get people uh, their first step into electronics. You know, it's, it's a great learning experience, um, learning how voltages add up or how you can put them in parallel and things like that, um, yeah. to, you know, to serve different needs. Yeah. But yeah, we'll be talking about that in your, your upcoming All Portable Digital Zone APDZ with Charlie and Brian. Your the hosts, regular hosts of your show. That would be cool. I have Mike on there. He's also a big battery nerd. He has all different capacities. He likes uh, reviewing some of them, and he's also built a few of his own. So that ought to be yeah, cool. Yeah, he's a fellow Michigander, yep. now transplanted to Texas. Yep. I, I feel like a lot of people, uh, this is something that I, I recently talked about this topic with uh, temporarily offline uh, Steve over in Wisconsin uh, on his live stream. We just did a brief discussion about some of the batteries that I've built, but something I failed to mention was that they are largely Chinese components. And some people are pretty averse to that. They're like, eh, I'm just going to buy one if I have to, you know, get parts from China. I don't want to. But little do people realize, I mean, I'd say 90, 90 plus percent of the things you buy even here are Chinese components, you know, it's, you can't get around it. They're, they're being produced there so much more than they're being produced here. So it's hard to find a truly USA made and manufactured battery. So, I mean, I just go that route. I know that I'm taking risks every time when I'm buying these really cheap battery management system boards and cells, you know, you never know really the quality of the cells that you're getting. If you buy them like on AliExpress or, Alibaba or even eBay, but I just try them and see how well they work. I've had some that didn't turn out to be so well. And more often than not, I've had a lot of great ones that, that overperform to what the specs are. I know I would imagine right now during the pandemic that it's kind of hit and miss as far as uh, being able to take delivery of some of the components right now. I know um, there's a lot of discussion about, uh, shortages in electronics products going across all markets, especially automotive, that they're even having a difficult time uh, sourcing enough to, to build vehicles sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's kind of a weird tangent. Let me get back to your activities. Why don't you tell me more about your ham radio activities, what you do in Arizona with your groups, you know, what your favorite, uh, we've already mentioned that you love soda but why don't you tell us more about that as well? All right. I'm a member of a local ham club out here, Superstitch Amateur Radio Club, and uh, I enjoy being able to do outdoor-type activities. So so I work with the uh, Ham Fest as well as any outdoor activities such as field day, work with everybody on that, and uh, whether it's summer or winter field day, those are, are primarily big uh uh, activities that we enjoy doing. 
so we get out, especially during the summertime, we head up to the up to the mountains and uh, there's a really great place that uh, Charlie has been able to get for us for the last several years. And uh, it's really fantastic uh, location. So we really enjoy doing that. So um, tell me about superstition. So the first time I ever visited Phoenix, there's a lot of mention of superstition. I was like, what is, is everyone here not stepping on cracks and, and afraid to walk under ladders? What's going on here? And to the outsider, it's an odd name. <laughs> So it's, it's a mountain range, right? That's close Correct. to yeah. where you're at. Yeah. Out past uh, Mesa, there's the Superstition uh, Mountains, and it's a very large, vast uh, group of mountains and preserves and uh, in the forest uh, out that way. And it's got a lot of very challenging uh, mountains up there. Uh, one of them that I've never attempted to do yet, it's kind of on my list, is Flatiron. It's, it's a long, arduous hike. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, it's a very large area out there and a lot of people, uh, go out there to hike into camp and stuff. And, uh, it's, it's beautiful, uh, grouping of mountains out that way. And so your, your club again is the superstition amateur radio club or superstition ARC. That's correct. Yep. You you mentioned we're named after that because we were originally when we started out, we were, out in that neck of the woods and now we're located here in mesa arizona how big is the club uh there's generally there's about 205 210 members uh in our in our club at any given time so a lot of diversity as far as what people enjoy Mm -hmm. you know whether it's home uh operations or some tinkering or if it's soda activities or or field day so we have a, a pretty large group of hams uh a lot of hams help other hams here uh, in the club, or even if they're not club members. So we have a, a group that, you know, we they've done everything from helping you to put up an antenna or help wire up your house to um, we've got some older hams that needed some help uh, just, you know, doing yard work or something like that. So uh, we're really fortunate. Uh, we've got a good group of younger hams even, which is uh, really great uh, in the, in the club. So we really enjoy working with those guys because they always have uh, lots of good and fresh ideas. Mm, Okay. It's, it's interesting too, that, I mean, I only get the focused view of your view and Charlie and, and see the activities that you two do, but I've noticed that you have an emphasis on portable operations. Have you created any converts to portable ops from your activities with uh, superstition ARC? Well, I think most people uh, like to do both. Um, I've, I've gotten to the point where um, uh, my home rig hasn't really been on that much, probably in the last year. It's maybe been on once or twice as I've been focusing mostly on portable operations. So for me, it doesn't matter if it's on a soda peak or if it's uh, out camping or something like that. Um, anytime you can get out and do something with with less and be amazed at the number of contacts you make, uh, it's it's uh, the thing I strive for now. Mm-hmm. What's your main setup for going portable right now, like rig, antenna, and all that? My favorite rig uh, I'm using now is a KX3. Um, along with, uh, I use a linked dipole, uh, 20, 30 and 40 meters is my primary. Um, and then I've just got, uh, a couple of masks that I use. Matter of fact, I just, uh, got a new, uh, carbon six mass that I used yesterday, um, worked out pretty good. It was definitely a lot lighter than my 7,000, uh, from soda beam. So that was a nice, uh, change in pace. Yeah. I want to get, uh, I, I've been on the soda beam site. Recently, I, I want to get one of those those travel masks that they have that that folds up that it can actually fit inside your backpack. Yeah, that's those, those uh, that's cool. what I got. Um, I was a little dis- disappointed. Unfortunately, I, I broke the the top off the mask, but it still works fine. But um, it uh, held up really well in the wind and everything. Yesterday, it got pretty windy on the peak, but. Um, I was quite impressed. It's, it's definitely a lot more lightweight and uh, enjoyable to carry so that it, it leaves some space in the backpack for, for other things that you may want to take along. Yeah. Do you think that carbon fiber as a material affects the 
the radiation, I guess, or the the performance of the antenna in any way mess with the SWR or anything like that? Um, I didn't have that problem yesterday. I was the first run out with it. So, you know, I'm kind of on the fence. I understand that uh, VHF and uh, UHF that it does that you kind of have to be using a, like a roll of J pole or something that you want to kind of pull it away from the mast. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I didn't even use that yesterday because, uh, I just used my rubber duck because we were close enough in uh, to the local area here to make plenty of uh, VHF contacts uh, yesterday. But uh, my understanding is, is that it does affect it on VHF, but it's pretty easily solvable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know very much about that. I don't have a carbon fiber mass. It's only what I've heard or read. So I was curious of, of the effects. I know a lot more hams are picking up the carbon fiber masts and trying to those out and i was just curious if if it does mess with the signal at all or the you know the radiation of the of the antenna yeah it'd be interesting to see uh what the conductivity of of these are so it'd be interesting to find out how you could actually test that and uh put it in real numbers yeah so do you have any pr proudest achievements in ham radio that you'd like to mention uh, last year, I uh, got my mountain goat here in Arizona, so that was uh, probably the the biggest achievement that I've had in, in amateur radio. I'm just starting to get in more and more into contesting. Uh, I never thought that I would enjoy contesting. Um, we did the Arizona CUSO party last year, and I think for the, the soda activities and you know being competitive about being able to pick people out of the out of the noise or seeing how many contacts you can get kind of pushes you to enjoy contesting a little bit more, it seems like. So I think I'll kind of put that into my, my backpack as I go along. So contesting is mm -hmm. something that I've really started to enjoy a lot more. Congrats on the mountain goat. That is really a hard thing to get. So uh, I know that there have, there are a couple people who I've talked to interviewed who are double mountain goats or triple shack sloths. I mean, that's, that's a lot of dedication. So even attaining the mountain goat status is, is something that to me personally, I don't know if I'll ever reach that, <laughs> especially at the pace that I'm going right now, <laughs> but that's a lot yeah. of points. That's a lot of climbs. Yeah. It took me five years, but COVID really helped me to, you know, push the numbers up last year. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, that made it, uh, made it good from that respect. But one thing I've noticed though is, and yesterday was a, a good, uh, uh, display of that where, you know, I'm more apt now, I think to, now that I've got that to just spend more time on the mountains and, you know, you know, not worry about running from one mountain to the next and just spend time making contacts, uh, more contacts on a, on a particular peak and, waiting for other people to show up because you know they're going to be out there so you can get a, su a summit to summit uh, yeah, in there yeah. as well it's got to be it's got to be tough if you're especially if you're trying to coordinate the summit to summit and person's like still an hour or two away from <laughs> from hitting the peak and setting up right yeah and then you know it, it's a little disappointing if you if you just can't hear them but Oh, yeah, um, yeah. I've been pretty fortunate working out of California, got, get quite a few summit summits out of California, uh, especially on 40 meters. Yeah. So what's taking you the longest to get good at in ham radio? I'll have to go with CW on that. I'm, I'm still not any good at it. And matter of fact, I've still yet to do my first uh, soda activation in CW. So uh, that's something that I definitely have to get done uh, before field day get that out of the way. So, uh, we've got quite a few goats out here that are pushing me on for that. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the next big thing. The, the goat peer pressure, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of one-sided though. If you watch a lot of YouTube channels with ham radio operators who are into soda, it's, it's very CW centric. And I know that that could be a demotivator for some because they're like, well, not only is it hard, but now I got to learn CW to to do this thing. So it's, it's good that there are other operators out there who are reaching mountain goat who 
aren't predominantly CW, right? They're just getting up there and, and doing a lot of voice, sometimes digital, but uh, other modes. I know that KG6HQD Jerry was one of those guys that he'd, he'd attack any mountain and then do it all SSB. Yeah, and it's pretty interesting. I think SSB is pretty challenging because there's there's less of it out there now. And everybody that we take up on the mountains, you know, for the first or second time or whatever, and we usually do single sideband. Um, but it's amazing, though, the number of C- primarily CW ops that'll carry a microphone and and uh, all of a sudden you hear them into your pileup. So, I mean, I've had yeah. Steve from Colorado come on and, you know, several people out of California that have come on and and uh hit me up on single sideband and all of a sudden you know you're kind of like wow oh okay nice yeah so what are some of the things that you're currently working on like projects or kits builds antennas that you're currently that you got on your workbench right now well i'm starting to work on a trap dipole for soda uh 10 20 and 40 I've never built one like that before. I've, I've used primarily link dipoles, so I want to try that and see what the differences are. And sometimes it's kind of a hassle to get up and go change clips and everything. So I figured I'd try one of those and see how how I like that. And it'd be interesting to see what how it pans out on the meters uh, once I get up on top of a mountain. Also, I'm toying with at some point getting rid of some of my hundred watt gear here at the house and just using my Elecraft or maybe purchasing a 705 and coupling that uh, with a home built LDMOS uh, amp and mm, see how okay. that goes. That'd be cool. Speaking of your home setup, I mean, what is your favorite gear? And maybe you can also tell us about how you do operate at home. Okay. I primarily operated with uh, dipoles at home. My lot's kind of, kind of small. So that's the, the best I've been able to do for quite a while. But uh, I've got a, a 991 that uh, I enjoy operating with because it's kind of a shack in the box. And I've also got a 1200, a DX1200 that I've operated with uh, in the past as well. So it's a little difficult because uh, we're right in the middle of the, the city. So we get quite a bit of noise uh, in my neighborhood, even though uh, our utilities are, are buried in our neighborhood. There's quite a bit of extra noise here in the valley. I would imagine there's a lot of solar out there as well. That's that's the main noisemaker in in my neighborhood. I pick up a lot of the solar. Yeah, we've uh, we've been seeing a lot more solar coming into our neighborhood. Uh, we've got uh, someone who's about three doors down from us now. And uh, when his came online, you could definitely tell the difference. And I know of some other hams here in the in the valley who've struggled with that as well, especially on certain bands, you know, you can hear it all day long. And then as soon as it, it goes past sunset, the noise goes away. Yeah. That's what happens with me. And I, I think I'm to blame for my own problems at home because I, I try a lot of off grid, you know, just get an RV style solar panel and, and put it up and then I'll try to turn on the radio and there's all these spikes all over the place. And I know that that wasn't there before I did that. So I think I'm, I'm creating my own problems in the home QTH. It's like my, my conflict. Do I want to operate during the day? <laughs> like, especially on 40 and lower 30 is okay, but 40 and lower trying that during the day is next to impossible because of all the, the solar RFI that I generate. But yeah, uh, after that, but it is good the for, sunsets, for like charging up groups of batteries, though, and operating at night, especially. So yeah. you, you can't beat that for a noiseless environment. Yeah, so I, I just kind of rationalize it. I say, well, I'm not on 40 and 80 anyways during the day. I mean, it's almost impossible to get anything going there. So I stick to 30 and above when I'm operating to, during the day, and I don't see those spikes as prominently. And then as soon as the sun sets, then I start trying out the lower bands. And by then, the solar charge controllers and everything have turned off. <laughs> it's a little quieter. Yeah, it's definitely difficult to find a good solar charge unit nowadays. They're out there, but they are a little 
a little pricier than than you know people often want to pay for them. Yeah. So, any other favorite gear? You've mentioned your KX3. You have your 991, and you mentioned a DX1200. I don't actually know what that is. What is a DX1200? Uh, that's a Yesu. It's a hundred watt. Um, oh, okay. Rig. Yes, okay. Um, it's been around for quite a while. It does not get as as much use as it used to. Um, I've gotten pretty used to the 991 because that's what we take up to field day and stuff. So that's my primary rig. So that's uh, the 1200 probably would be the first one to go if it comes to fruition to go ahead and build a nice LD Moss amplifier, and that would fund that project. Mm-hmm. The 991 is an all mode transceiver. Yes. Yeah. Yep. That's what and I thought. it does digital as well, which is nice. Just plug it in and off you go. So I really like that rig just because of all the, those particular features. Mm-hmm. Are you doing a lot of this uh, just with power supplies or do you have any kind of like emergency battery backup for your home setup or your portable field setup? Uh, not really. Um, every once in a while, I'll crank up my Yamaha generator I bought for field day. So I'll crank that up just to keep that well lubricated and stuff during the course of the year. Uh, otherwise, it only gets out to field day events and, and gets used for those. But uh, I'll try and crank that up every so often, just give it some runtime and keep it uh, in good shape. Yeah. Makes me think about, I, I'm currently trying to get parts for my own battery backup. I don't know if you saw the tech preppers one video about his hand truck setup. He, he got I did. a lithium iron phosphate battery and a, a gigantic inverter. I have never seen an inverter that big before, but uh, apparently it's can peak to 6,000 Watts if you need. So it could like run a well pump or something, <laughs> but you know, with the recent wind and the annual California fires, it's always been on my mind. What am I going to do in an extended power outage? And so that's probably something that we'll discuss in your, your next APDZ, just those, yeah. those scenarios. But I'm trying to well, put together it, something that has a little bit more capacity. I think uh, if I get the batteries, I don't even know because I'm, I keep looking at the, the shipment page and it just says ready for pickup. And I ordered them about a month ago. If I can get that going, I think I'll have a good, what is it, three and a half kilowatt hours of standby, which ought to oh, run that's stuff. A good, that's a lot. Yeah. So that'd be pretty nice. And especially, you know, with the issues you guys have experienced out in California. And then you look at what's happened in Texas over the last week and a half here. Yeah, exactly. You know, it kind of brings all that to the forefront again. So, and, and they have multiple uses, right? You can use those things at home. You can use them, you know, while you're out portable, you know, and people, you know, you can take it even if you're just going camping, for example, and exercise that equipment. And then that way, when there's a need at home, you know, you're used to it. You, you fully understand how to, how it operates and it's easier to implement. Yeah. The stuff's out there now. So even if you can get components faster, like go commercial with a battle worn battery or something like that, it's, uh, it's fairly easier to get the, the core backup system built, but I'm finding now nowadays the, the bottleneck is solar. Like it's it's pretty hard to find good solar sources that are both portable and effective. A lot of the solar that you see that's portable, like the folding panels, if they are like not name brand types, they are kind of unreliable. I've tried several different roll up and fold up panels, and I found they've really underperformed to what I was expecting. And then your only other alternatives are these names like Power Film where you get a hundred watt folding panel for that. And it costs you $1,600, which is like more than the whole backup system. <laughs> if you do it yourself. Right. And it, it really makes it difficult to, to justify. And then if you use a uh, standard home type panel, they're very difficult to protect, you know, if you're using them in any kind of mobile kind of environment as yeah. well. So you got to, you got to really plan those things out and decide, you know, what's important and, you know, being able to protect your panels there is a big deal. Yeah. I got four 
175 watt used solar panels. They're about 35 pounds each. So not exactly your type of thing that you just throw in the trunk. And I mean, it won't even fit in my trunk. Those, those are great panels, but they're not exactly something that I could take with me somewhere. So right. I, I do have a hundred watt. I think it's a Renogy panel that's meant for RV roofs. And that one is kind of portable, but it's still, it's glass. It's an aluminum frame. It's jagged and sharp. Very easy to hurt yourself carrying that thing around. So not quite there yet in terms of bringing this build that I'm about to make anywhere like camping or anything like that. I got to find something. I would appreciate any recommendations if listeners have ideas (laughs) of something that is foldable and I know a lot of people just say, just go with power film, just bite the bullet and, and, and get those because they're great. And I know they're great, but yeah, even the, the smaller sized panels are hundreds of dollars. And it's like, oh, really? These cost way more than even the most expensive components of what I'm making here. <laughs> it's very yep. hard to justify, especially since I'm not going to use it as the primary way to charge this system. It's, it's like it, while the grid is up, I'm plugging this thing in. And it's going to be that rare occasion when I will need it solar the most. But then, yeah, the solar panels are just so prohibitively expensive. Yep. Even the even good inverters are pretty expensive uh, as well. So yeah, you can you can really put quite a bit of money into it. But you know, if you're going to use it quite often, and if you're going to use it at home, you know, the cost is isn't that bad. It's just a matter of, you know what you're comfortable with. Yeah. So, any Elmers or Ham Heroes that you want to mention? Um, Steve, uh, WG uh, OAT out there, he, when I first got started in portable operations, I used to watch all his videos. They were always great. Yeah. Um, really enjoy those. And then Charlie uh, and J7V and Brian, uh, W7JT, they kind of got me uh, involved in soda. They were given a presentation. And I had seen some of Steve's videos. And so I talked to them for a while and they got me out on my first hills. And after that, it's just been uh, a constant motion to hit as many hills as possible. Just took took off from there, huh? Yeah. Well, they always seemed, you know, they always made it a lot of fun to, uh, to get out on a hill. And, uh, you know, we'd always, they're always good about discussing, you know, the, the last hills that they've been on and, mm-hmm. They're full of information, so it, it kind of makes it easy and, and very enjoyable uh, when you got Elmers like that around. Yeah. So Charlie and Brian did kind of a presentation in your club, is is that what you're saying? And then you got interested from their presentation and talked to them more about it? Yeah, Brian Brian primarily yeah, gave that presentation, and him and Charlie were talking in, in between a break there, and I walked up, and that was I was very new to the club, and they were – you know, more than happy to talk to me about portable operations and getting out on a, on a summit and, uh, operating and everything. And matter of fact, that the first couple of times, uh, out, that was more, probably more CUSOs to, on those mountaintops than I'd had on my home station for sure. So it made it even more enjoyable. That's great. Yeah. That's, that's really cool when you have someone in your club who's really excited about something and, and just wants to talk about it with whoever is curious and it just makes me think about this thing i i I went to uh kind of a a a virtual conference or i I don't know what a presentation uh one time by gartner and they discussed potential versus momentum and i don't know why this popped in my mind but it's just kind of something that i think about with with regard to anything that we go after we talk about the potential of things and, and that's why that's what drives a lot of ham radio, like gear purchases, antenna purchases. We, we look at things and we're very fascinated by the potential of what we could do with them. But it takes someone, an Elmer or you know a fellow enthusiast, or even just personal experimentation and just getting the ball rolling to build that momentum where that's what that's where the actual enjoyment happens. It's not in the acquisition of all the gear that can do these things, but it's in the starting off and then getting the ball rolling 
And after a while, you're just like, well, this is just what I do. You know, this is so much fun. And it's because you have this momentum with it. You're moving along and you're just looking at better and more efficient ways and more exciting ways to do that activity. And I, I yeah, feel like it's, it's, it's that's it's very really true. Cool. Um, you know, you brought up a good point, you know, that uh, it's just what I do. And you kind of take it for granted after a while. It's just something that you enjoy, you know, and you enjoy the planning for it and you enjoy getting out on, you know, the trail or you enjoy, you know, if you're out for multiple mountains, for example, and you camp in between, mm -hmm. there's all of those little different aspects of portable operations that, you know, I don't get at home and it just broadens everything out as far as all the different things that I enjoyed, even, you know, from when I was a kid, we used to go camping a lot. And now if I'm out over a weekend and I'll do hills on Saturday and Sunday, I'll camp out overnight. And I just camp out in the back of my pickup truck and I've got my camp stove and all that kind of stuff. And it, it's amazing. You can be out in the middle of a national forest and just enjoy listening to the, the sounds in the forest and uh, watching the stars go overhead, you know, the things that you, you don't get to see in the city where you, where you live. And after a while, you just kind of note all those different aspects of portable operations that you enjoy. Yeah. That's why everyone's advice that I uh, interview is uh, they say, just get out there and operate. And what they're indirectly trying to say is get the ball rolling. Because once you start, it, it just it just keeps moving. Once you you have your first taste of that, and then people can slow down. They can take breaks and stuff, and then it, it's really hard to get get going again. But yeah, it's really in the practice that things really come alive in ham radio. Yeah, and it's amazing the the different things that you learn about the state that you live in. For example, as you travel through you know, small town America, for example, and yeah. uh, all the neat things about small towns and um, getting out on a forest road and, and things like that. You, you just learn so much more about the geography of your state, as well as the people who live in your state and the different kinds of businesses and how people make a living, for example. I mean, mm -hmm. um, I've been out on the roads and talked to uh, cowboys as they're bringing in their herds in the middle of the Arizona mountains, you know, and mm -hmm. I never thought that I'd ever see something like that. And, you know, they talked to me for a good half hour about what it's like to be a cowboy in Arizona and, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, be responsible for bringing herds in. So really fascinating, uh, experiences. Yeah. We need horses on the air. There you go. <laughs> we need something like that where uh, I'll operate from the back of a horse. I'm good with that. <laughs> yeah. We need something like that where you're, you're out in the, in the wilderness on your horse and calling CQ. I don't know how that would work though, but it sounds really cool. <laughs> as long as I don't have to make horse noises, I'll be okay with it. Yeah. <laughs> so as we close here, is there anything you want to say or uh, plug, give advice about, um, you know, just, uh, two items, I guess, you know, tune in for the all portable digital zone, especially this weekend, we'll be talking about batteries. So that'd be yep. great. Looking forward to that. And, uh, also on your podcast, uh, earlier in the week, you were talking about, you know, the things that we all as hams collect and projects that, you know, you had good intentions for and they never happen and stuff. And, what do you do with that stuff? And yeah, I, I've been bantering this around for a while because I've got several items that I want to get rid of. I was like, well, I'm just going to wait for the ham fest, you know, and these things, you know, probably, you know, 25 to $50 kind of items, you know, it's like, well, why not just give those things away, you know, to other hams that I know that are in need of those things. They can put them to good use. Yeah. So that, that kind of, lit my fire for making that final decision. So it will be interesting to see the responses I get and see if, uh, how many, how much of this stuff I can put to better use by giving it to a needy ham. Yeah, that's cool. I'm glad that it had that effect. And, you know, ham fests are good too. 
It's just we don't know when we'll actually have one. <laughs> but yeah. Like I would go to a ham fest with a bunch of, of gear that I don't use and, you know, just say, okay, you want this dollar, you know, or, you know, it's just something, some token amount so they don't feel like, you know, they're taking advantage of me or something. And yeah, just, just sharing it that way as well. I mean, it, it wasn't my intention with the last episode to get too much into like go minimalist and give away all your stuff. But I know everyone has something that they're thinking who could use this. Cause I don't <laughs> very true. Yeah. And sometimes that's the barrier too. It's just all the difficulty. It's kind of like why I don't, I'm not an eBay seller. You know, there's just a lot of difficulty in, in getting everything properly communicated out there and, and finding the interest, finding the right, you know, recipient. So it's just, it's, it's some work, but I mean, I just think about all the stuff gathering dust that I have. Yeah, I'm the same way. I've got a closet with several items in there that should have a new home by now. So, yeah. Yeah. So anything else before we close? Here? Uh, no, just, uh, you know, don't be, you know, as you go along your ham radio uh, career, look for new experiences, you know, get out and out in the countryside and operate, you know, whether you're doing it from a campsite or uh, a favorite national park somewhere, travel for the day, or if you're staying overnight or if you want to try soda, get out and try something new and different. Uh, you'd be amazed at the number of contacts you can make with uh, lower power gear, especially. And even if you have your 100 watt rig, take it out with you and enjoy some time out in, out in one of your national forests or national park and spend some time enjoying nature. Yeah, exactly. Just get out there, as people say, and experience nature with radio. It's awesome. Yep. All right, Dan, thank you very much for being on the show today. I will link the All Portable Discussion Zone link as well as your Twitter. Uh, any others? Do you have any other social media type accounts, Instagram or anything uh, like that? No, primarily on Twitter is where I primarily interact with other ham radio operators that seems to be the best place to to do that mm -hmm. okay so if you want to see dan in action go to the all portable discussion zone and you'll probably see him as a uh, a, a special guest in some of charlie's videos as well when he activates you'll see him in the background there operating activating peaks in the joint activations but again thanks dan for for your time Thanks for Thank being you. on the show, and uh, I'll say 7-3. 73. You've been listening to Handum Thoughts by AD60M. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you again next week.